Good evening, my name is Amy McDonald. I'm the director of City Space, and it is always a pleasure when someone from our NPR family is in conversation on our City Space stage. I know many of you will recognize the voice of Michelle Norris, longtime host of All Things Considered, and the first African-American female host at NPR. She has been a columnist for the Washington Post since 2019. What you may not know is that for the last 14 years, she has been involved in an endeavor she started called the Race Card Project, which became the book we are here to discuss, our hidden conversations, what Americans really think about race and identity. Michelle could not be better served than having her interlocutor this evening be our own Rupa Shinoy, host of Morning Edition. Rupa was the creator and host of Otherhood, a reported narrative podcast about race and identity among children of immigrants. She went on to cover human rights for the world and BBC, including an award-winning year-long series in 2019. We will be taking your questions throughout the hour. Please go to slido.com and type in Norris. Please welcome Michelle Norris and Rupa Shinoy. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I can already tell how wonderful you are. Thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor, and it's such an honor to be here with you. I oh, cannot It's my say. honor. It's great to be here with you. It's great to be in Boston. We love having you here. Thank you so much for being here. Can you start us out, lay a foundation for us? We want to have a deep conversation worthy of this incredible book which is so raw. I've been telling you all night that I've been listening to it for two weeks and to the audiobook. And if you've listened to the audiobook, it has the people's voices. And it's just like so many people just speaking so intimately right in your ear and so raw. It's like you have a best friend with like so many people in one book. So tell us how the race card project came about. Why six words? Um, first, thank you all for coming out this evening in this beautiful space. And of course, the acoustics are great, right? Um, I created the Race Card Project 14 years ago because I wrote a book about my family's um, very complex racial legacy in a book called The Grace of Silence. This is actually my second attempt to write a book about race in America. I was planning to go out. I had taken a leave from um, my job as a host of All Things Considered, and I was going to go out and listen to America because America at that point was having a conversation about being post-racial. Mm. <laughs> I know you can't even say that word right now, right? No. <laughs> and I thought, well, a black family has moved into the White House, and we're post-racial? <laughs> Y'all better put your seatbelts on. I think that <laughs> this is not the way that's going to turn out. But what happened is when I started listening to people, my own family started serving up stories and I learned secrets in my family that had never been shared with me. So I wound up writing a memoir instead of a grand book about race in America. And when I went out to promote that book, I was on a 35, actually 36 city book tour. And because I spent so much time in a studio, I wanted to use the book tour as a way to talk to people, to get, you know what it's like. I feel that, yeah. You, you know, you, you really want, I was free, I could talk to people, but I was gonna be talking to them about race and I thought, oh, people don't wanna talk about race. Then? Well, that's what I thought. <laughs> so I created this invitation where I was working with Melissa Bear, who I'm still working with 14 years later. She designed the first cards. And we printed these postcards that were black and they just said, Race your thoughts, six words, please send. We printed 200 of them at a Kinko's on Wisconsin Avenue <laughs> next to the Red Door Salon, <laughs> where I used to get my nails did. And, um, and of the 200, about 30% came back to us. And that's a pretty good yield, yeah. And so then I got 
my publisher to print cards, and every city we went to, we left, we got, we got to know printers all over the country, and I would leave cards at events like this on the chair. I would leave them wherever I went. So if you opened up, if you were in need, standing in the need of prayer at a Marriott hotel and you picked up the Bible, ooh, there's a postcard in here. <laughs> I would leave them in the, in the kiosk, at the restaurant. I just left them everywhere. And they started to come back to us. And then we created a website because we wanted to share what we were getting with other people. And then we created a place for people to submit digitally. So most of the cards would come in digitally. And the inbox was just so interesting. Carlene Watson is here tonight. And her husband, Walter Ray Watson, was an early part of this journey. And I produced race card project stories for National Public Radio. And we would just marvel at the inbox and see you know, America unburdening itself on this issue that I thought no one wanted to talk about. And it became a little bit of an obsession for you, because it's not like it was always welcomed. You know, it became an obsession, and, I, and I, it was hard because most people didn't get it. You know, I, I would try to explain it. I was always writing at work. I was writing memos. I was trying to raise funds for it. I was trying to figure out how to do it, and people couldn't get it. I think not until this, I think this book is the, is the moment that people, oh, that's what Norris has been doing. <laughs> because people would say things to me, like I ran into someone at a, um, I'm not going to call her name out, but I ran into somebody at a, uh, at a Christmas party. And she said, are you still doing that little six-word thing? <laughs> and I just think it's hard for people to understand, you know, that you're asking people on this big topic to write something down in six words. But you see in the book, when you, when you read the book, you'll see that people can pack so much into just six words. You said dirt, so I scrubbed. White, not allowed to be proud. Raised in privilege, hadn't a clue. That's from you tonight. Yeah. Being honest is better than silence. I hope I'm not a racist. So a lot happened in the time that these cards were coming back to you. How did you see what people said change? So you asked me about six words. I just want to say a quick oh, that's about right, yeah. that, because I didn't answer that part of your you question. You didn't? No. Um, why six words? Because I knew people would understand a six word concept because there were a lot of six word activities out in the world. Um, six word sports, six word memoir, six word Minneapolis, six words, you know, and, and uh, wired. You know, there's a lot of people who were doing that. So I thought people would understand it. But I also knew that if you took something really complex and reduced it to just six words, not just one sentence, but six words, it would be reductive. You would get to the essence of what was really important to people, and I knew that if I asked people for a sentence, they would give me a paragraph. Mm -hmm. And if I asked for a paragraph, people would say, oh, I don't have time for that. That's just, you know, that feels like an, a mandate, an assignment. So six words just felt right. In the beginning, because we were kind of thinking about America becoming post-racial, a lot of the cards at the beginning were aspirational. Mm -hmm. And we call them rainbow and bunny cards, you know. Um, a lot of people quoted Rodney King. Can't we all just get along? Uh, only one race, the human race. Uh, DNA is 99% the same. But I think the website was really important. And then I think what we did on the radio was really important because both of those things modeled for people I guess, rules of engagement. So when people saw the depth of the cards on the website and people heard the stories that we put on the air, they were thinking, oh, OK, wait. People are really digging deep in their six-word stories. And I think that that is also why we have such a broad diaspora of responses. Because the majority of the responses that have come in for the majority of the years that we've been doing this work are from white Americans. And that was not what, what I expected. You expected. Yeah. yeah. I mean, most conversations about race, let's be honest, if we have a conversation about race, there's an expectation. It's going to be led by people of color if something happens in the news and it, is, it, is, it has a racial undertone or directly is about race. 
there is this expectation that you're going to hear from a certain number of people. You go to the part of the contact list, or if you still have a Rolodex, you know, you call there. It's usually a person who's black. It's usually someone who's a cleric. You know exactly who you're going to hear from. And that's what I expected, This that the inbox would sort of be filled with people of color and probably primarily black people. I did not think that I would be embarking on a 14-year odyssey of listening to white folks talk about race. I, I, <laughs> I, I didn't even think that was possible. And, and yet I'm so happy that I've been able to do that because it has taken me into places that I otherwise would never have access to. And it has helped me understand how much we are missing in our conversations about race because of the way that we frame them. And when I say we, I'm talking about in the public square, but I'm also talking about those of us who practice the craft of journalism. It was very humbling to me to realize that I'd been covering race for a long time, but my lens was just too small. Because? Because of, of you know, as I said, you know, when we talk about race, I mean, uh, uh, the example that I've been sharing with people is when you probably remember the incident, um, it's almost a year and a half, maybe two years ago, uh, someone drives, and we could probably choose, you know, to pick, to pick, take your choice. But the incident that I'm thinking about is when someone drove across several states, goes to a grocery store, and I believe it was upstate New York, shoots several people while they're buying groceries. Yeah. And the coverage around that, again, were several people of color lamenting the hate that is often directed at them. And we didn't invite when I say we, the grand we, the royal we in the, you know, in the media, didn't invite um, Caucasian people to be part of that conversation. And yet this was a white man who did that. And, and so if we're talking, why aren't we talking about the roots of hate with a bigger audience? You know, so that's an example. And, it, and, it, and that, that is about something horrible that happened. But it also made me realize that even in the places that we work, how many of you have been in diversity committees? How many of you have been in minority training you know, seminars, diversity seminars, and they're not really diverse. You know, at my kids' school, we used to have these diversity programs all the time, and then this, again, because the project gave me a second sight and then gave me a little bit of courage to speak up yeah. in spaces because I, I see things differently after listening to so many people talk about race. I'd be in these meetings that were talking about diversity. Well, this is a diversity committee. It's not diverse. If you want to call it the Black People's Committee, let's just call it that. But if you actually want to talk about creating a diverse culture in this school where our kids are learning together, then the families of color shouldn't be expected to carry the burden or, to, or, or expected to always you know, carry the load. Because I don't want to say it's a burden because the work is not always burdensome. That We have to make sure that we have... I believe in Jose Andreas's theory about stop building walls, start building tables, longer tables with more chairs at the table. And that really colors much of the work that I do now. Um, let's get to some of the sound. Let's have people hear some of these voices. Uh, Brandy's voice and how she kind of... Uh, tell us about Brandy. Um, she is, should we listen to her first and then I'll... Yeah, sure. Yeah, she kind of explains it herself. Yeah, she explains it, but then I'll tell you a little bit what I've learned about people who have her condition. Mm -hmm. No, not mixed. Just albino black. Brandy Green, Chicago, Illinois. I constantly am asked, what are you? Or are you mixed? Nope, I'm black and albino. It's a fascinating existence. What's good? I'm a New Yorican, baby. Christina Labrador, Copeg, New York. Oh, yeah. Are you Indian? The man behind the 7-Eleven counter asks me. Are you Egyptian? The parking attendant asks. You look Israeli, the bouncer at Cafe Wa says. Girl, you black, my black Israelite friends say. Yo Boricua! The dapper gentleman with a sharp suit, black sunglasses, and fedora proudly guesses. I get mistaken for Italian, Brazilian, Iranian, Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, Indian. It's rare when people guess Puerto Rican. But when they do, 
There's a little dance I do inside my head. I maybe might express it outside too. Isn't her voice beautiful? <laughs> That's is. why I wanted to include people's voices. People's voices, because I didn't want to have to voice that. I wanted to give her a chance to do that. Um, so in the first story, she's albino. She provided yes. a picture. Yeah. She's someone that you know. Yes, actually, we worked together at the Chicago Reporter. My first job at college. Total coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> But she's not the only person who is albino who shared their story. Yeah. And because of that, I've learned um, a lot about what it's like to be albino and the questions people ask, the things people are afraid to ask. And, and I'm included in one of them. I, you know, something you might want to learn about, but how do you easily ask that question? Um, I've learned that it's difficult for them to travel, that in some parts of the world they are seen as um, deities, and in other parts of the world, it's almost um, demonic. Like if, if you are a child who is albino, who was born in certain African countries, they have to secret that child out of, the, out of that country very quickly because, and this is just icky and hard to even say, but it is believed that um, their body parts will help heal those who are sick. And through this work, we've, we work with a lot of universities um, and those Cards have helped some of the schools we've worked with prepare their students for when they go overseas. Similarly, we've had cards from hundreds of people who have red hair. <laughs> they're not writing about race, they're writing about identity and how the world deals with them. And similarly, in certain parts of the world, if you have red hair, you have a steeper hill to climb. People will look at you in a certain way. Um, you have to protect yourself in certain ways. So the, the inbox has been um, an education for me, and, and we've been able to share that with others. I just want to say a word about the second story. Um, I love her voice. I love her energy. She is all over Instagram and TikTok not right now. Um, and you know when she says, I'm a, a New Yorkian baby, she's like, I'm in a book baby. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we hit the New York Times bestsellers list, I'm in a New York Times bestselling book baby. <laughs> Um, it's it's wonderful. It, this is this is not just my book. This belongs to the almost one thousand people whose stories are included in the book. But we have a, a question from an audience that uh, it has impacted you. So how has it shaped you over time to hear all of these stories? Because you honor every story with this level of detail that really speaks to your belief about people being unique, every experience being unique, and every experience being honored. And, but to give every, every story you hear that level of patience and that level of respect, it requires a lot from you, right? And, and I actually can't give every story that level of respect. We've archived more than half a million stories. Most of them are not limited to postcards. Most of them come in digitally. And I, over time, call people and I do oral histories and I just can't get to everyone. And that makes me, you know, I, I, there's just not enough hours in the, in the day um, but the work is is hard, but that doesn't mean that it's bad. I mean, it's challenging. We do lots of things that are challenging, and that actually is part of the gift of the work, that I have the opportunity to talk to people who often are saying something out loud for the first time, mm -hmm. and often not saying it to anyone else. When you read the book, there are two examples in the book, and they're just two of many, were people in the same household sent stories to me and didn't talk to each other. And they only discovered that they both sent stories to me when I like connected the dots for them. So they're eating meals together, they're living together. One of them was husband and wife. And they're talking to me but not talking to each other. So the honor that is associated with this work makes it easy for me to just figure out how to plow forward. That being said, it is, I have to sometimes figure out how to protect my heart. I have a mm. very good love circle. Some of my sister friends are in the audience tonight. They've been looking out for me um, to encourage me to practice self-care, to take a walk, to get out of my head sometimes. Um, but th this is the work that I've chosen to do now. And, and it's interesting because for a long time, I didn't want to be the reporter who covered race. You know, because I didn't want to be pigeonholed in that way. But now I feel like I have this taproot into this frequency 
that most people don't get a chance to hear. Like I have a secret, you know, it's like the radio station that's only some people can pick up. <laughs> and that's what it feels like to me. And when that many people give to your stories, you just, you know, figure out how to muscle up, how to take care of your heart, how to take care of your body and your brain. Um, and protect the stories. And I, I, I am a longtime storyteller. I am now a story collector. And in some ways, I feel like I've also become a story defender, like trying to protect the archive and make sure that it stays alive. OK, let's go to another um, story that you went deep on, the um, indigenous voice in, in uh, Minnesota, mm -hmm. Mariah. Dakota, Lakota, native, land, pride, and immigrant. I am a Dakota Lakota Sioux who is native to this now American land, but I feel like I am an immigrant. In this country, I feel like I came from a different country. I grew up in the public school district where I was not taught a thing about my Lakota Dakota heritage. Besides the traditional Thanksgiving, Native Americans were not mentioned in my years of school. I was once ashamed of my race because I always heard classmates taunting the Native accent and the assumptions of the Native American stereotypes. I came to learn my culture through my grandparents and oral history. Coming to find out how this country really came about, I was confused and upset. I still felt like an immigrant in our Native America. I was mad at myself for being ashamed. I was mad at those classmates for disrespecting me and my culture. I was mad at the school systems for not acknowledging the true history of these lands. And I'm still mad to this day. Doesn't she sound exhausted? Um, that's Mariah. Um, she's Lakota Dakota Sioux. She lives on a reservation in South Dakota and she teaches on a separate reservation in South Dakota. She was in an audience like this. I spoke at the University of Minnesota Morris, mm -hmm. which is up in the northern part of the state. And she sent her card in pretty quickly. And then much later, another gentleman who you didn't hear, but it was part of the same chapter, found his card. I don't know if it was on a, if he found it in a pocket or something, but it was like two years later he sent his card in. Mm. And his six words, he sent two six word stories, I flourish farming ancient tribal lands. Mm. And then he sent in a second six word story, my great great grandfather stood witness at Mankato. And the second story is about the War of 1862. How many of you learned about the War of 1862? No. Not taught. Um, this was a war um, against the, with the, the, you know, America being relatively new and, and against the Native Americans um, on the land. And as a result of this war, the Native Americans were forced, marched off the land in Minnesota and sent to South Dakota. And um, there were 38 people, 38 Native Americans who were hanged in the, it is still to this day the largest mass hanging in the US history, it was approved by President Lincoln. It was covered at the time, it was big, big news, and it was a result, for, you know, they were accused of war crimes. And the two people in the audience had a direct history, a direct link to that history. I don't know, they could have been sitting next to each other for all I know, but those two cards came to me, and when I realized, they, wait, they both came from Morris, they were both there that night, and then I fell into the rabbit hole of research mm -hmm. and learned all about the War of 1862 and tried to teach people about this, because I'm from Minnesota, and I didn't learn anything about this. I attended a school that was named for the governor of the state who, was, who put a bounty on the heads of Native Americans who didn't leave the state and would give people $200, $200 in 18... The 1860s was a lot of money, you know, if they would produce the scalp of, of an Indian. And, and I come from a state that is named, it takes its name from the Lakota language. And that really did a number on me because we're going to make you leave, but your language is so beautiful and lyrical that we're going to keep the name and we're going to keep the, you know, we're going to name the state for the... The state is named for the people who were forced to leave the land. And if you think about, you live in Massachusetts. You know, half of our states 
take names that are derived from native culture. And Massachusetts has its own history. And it's an example of how these six word stories can be portals into worlds that probably merit more of our attention. I was listening to that story the other day and I said I was gonna tell you, because I was a reporter for Minnesota Public Radio for four years or something like that. Um, they, they renamed Ramsey County High yes, no, they did. Ramsey High School. Yeah. That that the governor's name was Ramsey, but the county is still called Ramsey County. Yes, they renamed the high school, but not the county. Yes, the the high school is named for Alan Page, Gold Star. If anybody remembers Alan Page from the Minnesota Vikings, um, and who went on, he was your classmate. Stop. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and he was the first African American. Um, I think it was circuit court judge in the state of Minnesota, um, a proud you know, Minnesota uh, resident, and he now, and I went to Ramsey, and so it now bears his, his name. How about that? <laughs> Are you from Minnesota? Okay. <laughs> the voices that you heard, how did it change the way you saw, you know what, you were gonna tell us in the beginning that you wrote a book before this book. This Minnesota part reminds me of it. And remember um, the Quake Roads part. You wrote a book about your family. What did you learn about your family on the way to writing this book? Well, I, in, in that book, I, I, I called it the grace of silence because I realized that my parents never told me things that shaped their lives in significant ways. And I learned that my father was shot by a, a policeman, that he, had, he was wounded in his leg. Bullet just grazed his leg but he was trying to enter a building where black men who had returned from their military service were going in this building, it was a black owned building in Birmingham, Alabama, that's where he's from, called the Pythian Temple, because they wanted to learn as much as they could about the Constitution so they could pass the poll test. And my father, who was a very gentle man, very, very quiet, I, that night, he decided to assert his right to enter a building when policemen tried to stop him because they had just passed... They had just rendered a decision in the Supreme Court called Smith v. Allwright, which outlawed white-only primaries. And that sent chills throughout most of the southern states, because in many of the southern states, black people actually outnumbered white people. And if they were allowed to vote, that would upset the apple cart. So they did not want people to pass those poll tests. So my father asserted his right, a scuffle ensued, gun went off, and he was wounded in his leg. He had a scar. He ne I never knew about this. My mom never knew about it. But when I started doing research, everybody in the family in Alabama knew about it. Mm -hmm. So it was an example of just things that you know he never told me. My mother, on her side, she had secrets too. Her mother was a traveling Aunt Jemima, an itinerant Aunt Jemima. She worked for Quaker Oats. She traveled the country doing pancake demonstrations, wearing a hoop skirt and a headscarf, kerchief, and showing women how to use convenience packaging, convenience food when it was new. And no one wanted, you know, when Aunt Jemima is a member of your family, it's kind of complicated. No one wanted to talk about it. But I was able to do research and I found examples of where she did this work. I found a recording of her talking about the work and it turned out that, you know, I was able to give the family back something. And I learned that my grandmother did this work and she, she had a five state region, Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Dakotas, Iowa, and Michigan. And there were an army of these women who did this, and they were pretty well paid. I mean, she stepped onto the stage that was available to her at that moment, and they gave the traveling Aunt Jemimas this, um, this script that they were supposed to read. And they were supposed to talk about, Lazy, Lazy, I sure do love making some good old pain. You know, it's like Lazy spelled L-A-W-S-E-E. -E. And my grandmother, who had won oratory contests as a young woman, she was raised in Minnesota. Um, we're unusual because we're, um, my mother is a black family, fourth generation Minnesotan. That doesn't happen very often. Um, but she was very, script, very strict about her diction. And she was not doing that. So in the recordings I found, she talked about how she would go to small towns and she would serve the pancakes, but she would use the diction that she felt comfortable with. And she said that she knew that she was going to places where they had never seen a well-spoken black woman. And so she was, I loved it. It was like she was a bunker bomb. She was like subversive <laughs> going into these places. And she said she focused on kids because she said if, if, if a young kid could see an example 
of a composed woman who is speaking the king's english that 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 image would live in them and that she would sing gospel songs because she figured that would be a a link so i'm so glad that i actually you know this is an example of when people i, I, I we we talk in my family about you know when people are trying to stop us from teaching a difficult history you know and they're fighting against the so-called critical race theory in schools um, in my own family, we s struggled with that, you know, how to reach back. And I cite that as an example because, yes, it's difficult. M Grandma was doing this work at a moment where people were, people of color were trying to vote, trying to challenge public accommodation laws. So, you know, Aunt Jemima was, was sort of not on message, you know, at that moment. But at the same time, I was able to find within that something that we as a family can be very proud of. So were you learning those stories about your own family while you were getting the race card entries? So, no, I was learning the stories about my family, and I took a sharp left turn and decided to write a different book. So I didn't write a book about Amer how, what Americans think about race. And I wound up writing a family memoir. And then when I went out in the world to promote that book, that's when I created the race card project. Okay. And then, so... You were learning, you had learned things about yourself. You were learning about the world. I want to also bring in things were happening like um, a rise in Asian hate. Mm -hmm. And we have a voice there. Um, here's George and Todd. 1950 school registration. Joji becomes George. George, Joji, Hamamoto. Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm not your damn China virus. Todd Inouye, San Jose, California. So how did, how did the, all those things happening, just how were you trying to process them? How were you parsing them? How were you understanding them when so much was kind of coming together at the same moment? It, in the book, I liken it to um, when I, I grew up in a working class neighborhood in Minnesota and I was spent my father's from Birmingham and I was spent to spent I was sent to spend summers with my grandparents in Birmingham and in both cases working communities where no one had air conditioning and so in the summer it's very hot in Birmingham you'd be surprised to know how hot it is in Minnesota also and everyone keeps the windows open and as a kid when I would ride my little stingray banana seat bike up and down the alley, you heard everybody's business because the windows are all open. So you knew whose marriage was, you knew who got the new Jackson 5 album. You knew, I mean, you just knew everything because the windows were all open. This book reminds me of walking through America's neighborhoods at a moment when everyone's windows are open and you can hear everything. And I told you that I was surprised at the number of white Americans who, yeah. um, who stepped up. This also has helped me understand how many people are left out of the conversation about race because there are a lot of people who are sharing stories and feeling like they're sidelined in, in our big conversations about race, including many people who are Native American, who are Asian, who are Latino, um, who, who are part of a religious minority in, in a Christian America. And these two stories are an example of that. And they're individual to perhaps Asians, but they're also universal. universal. So George, who becomes Joji, you know, he's talking about, um, or Joji, who becomes George, is talking about the quest to become more American. And that is something that we hear from all kinds of people who come from Greece, who come from Italy. In the quest to become American, they try to assimilate in some way. They bevel the edges of their past. They don't eat certain things because they want their kids to, to be American. They don't speak the language at home. Um, and they Americanize their names. So that's an individual story, but it's also universal. And Todd's story is more um, contemporary and is an example of how the Race Card Project is sometimes a barometer. So we started during COVID to see people writing in about how afraid they were to go out. 
Um, and, and many times they were Asian. And some of the stories would, you know, just turn your stomach about the things people would say to people and um, the fear of, of going out in, in the street and having to order groceries, not because it was convenient, but because they were afraid to go out as an Asian presenting person and, and facing a wall of hate. When you read the book, you'll, in your I said, when you read the book. <laughs> um, Todd is a full page, there are 287 photos in the book, and Todd is a full page picture. And it's interesting how he, he bevels the edges of his story because he submitted a picture where he's sitting under a hair dryer with, with foil in his hair, getting his hair done. And it's this wonderful, whimsical picture that shows you that he's got a little bit of a sense of humor, but the words underneath are not humorous at all. And that juxtaposition is kind of interesting because it forces your mind to go, you know, in lots of different directions. And, and I think it, it animates his story in a, in a different way. And you thought it was important to give us some of those lighter moments, lighter juxtaposition. Yeah, I did when I juxtaposition. Sorry, I can't say it. That's all right. That that is that word trips me up all the time too. Um, When we were talking earlier, I was I was sharing that I I struggled so much with this book. I struggled with how how much of it would be me and how much of it would be the other stories. And I really wanted the stories of the individuals who who shared their lives to be the sort of ballast in this book. And so it's it's a book of essays, but in between every essay there's a river of stories. And the curation was challenging also. Okay, what themes do we focus on? And so what I tried to do is create movements within the book. And I, I actually, I'm not going to say I studied in an academic way, but I tried to f- look at how people composed music. And particularly symphonies, um, classical music, and jazz, because both had movements. And I wanted to understand how you would create momentum and when you needed to slow things down and when you wanted something that's like the crash of the symbols. And so at the end of the book, there's this long tome poem, which are just six word stories. Most of the, in the book, they have six word stories and backstories. But at the end, it's just a like a river of just six word stories that come at you. And I wanted to, it to feel like the end of Handel's Messiah. You know, we're all, everyone is, is singing all at once. And some of the chapters are organized by theme. And then there are other places where it's just chaotic because race is chaotic. And so I wanted it to have sort of messiness in the book also. So you would feel like all oh, these people are speaking at once. And then, you know, and then there would be breaks. So we do have moments of humor. Um, total non issue when the aliens arrive, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, when, and, you know, and then there are moments where people are using humor, but also there's a little bit of edge to it. So the gentleman Hiawatha sends in six words, lady, I don't want your purse. You know, that's funny, right? But can I ask the audience a question? Yeah, of course. So how many of you, and I want you all to be honest, please, how many of you have walked down the aisle at a grocery store, walked onto an elevator, and you don't even know why you do it. You pull your purse a little bit closer to you. You pat your wallet. How many, raise of hands, how, how many of you have done that? Okay, you, you all have a different kind of moral compass than most people because most rooms the hands go up high. And it's usually most people in the audience, including people of color. The converse of that is how many of you have had that experience where you step onto the elevator and someone pats their wallet or pulls their purse a little bit closer? How many of you have had that experience? Raise your hands up high. Yeah. So what I want you to think about and what Hiawatha, I think, wanted you to think about, for the people who clutch their purse, they probably just go on with their day. You know, you're driving down the street and you're see someone who doesn't look like you, does, not same skin color, not same zip code, you hit your, dar, your, your, your car lock. You, you've done that, haven't you? You've done that. And the car lock is really loud. <laughs> and you're totally busted. Because the car lock is like, doom, doom, doom. And someone looks at you like, lady, I don't want your purse. If you did that, 
you probably move on with your day. But the person, Hiawatha, who has this happen to him over and over and over again, he goes on with his day, but it cuts. It cuts. You know, it's not a mortal wound, but those little paper cuts can get infected, and they really hurt. So I like when people use humor, and I tried to pepper the book with that so that you would, because the book, there are heavy moments, but there are also moments that um, will just make you think, and then there are moments every so often where I wanted a little bit of whimsy. We've got two voices, good, um, uh, JC and Dimitri, that kind of get, because while you were getting these cards, all of a sudden we were getting videos yeah. of yeah. black people being stopped by police, and all of a sudden there was a shift in the country to believe in these violent police encounters that black people had been experiencing for very many years, but many Americans just didn't believe it. Would you mind playing those? Lights flipped, pulled over, relaxed, brother. J.C. Ousley, Houston, Texas. Running shouldn't lead to my death. Dimitri Julius, Austin, Texas. This is another case where the inbox was a barometer. Um, when Walter and I were working on these stories, we were hearing about Trayvon Martin before it was big news. So Trayvon Martin's story, a lot of you probably don't know this, but the Trayvon Martin story did not become national news for almost six weeks after it happened. It was not until people started to protest in New York. It was about a six-week period where no one knew what was going on. But we were starting to see stories come in from Florida where people were talking about this kid who got killed when he was walking home with Skittles and iced tea. Um, and it's an example of what happens when we've seen this daisy chain of black death on small screens. You know, we've watched, we've watched people perish in front of us at a kind of an alarming rate. And it is reflected in the, the archive. I, I liken what I do with this work to social dendrochronology. Dendrochronology being the study of tree rings. And when you cut down a tree, the tree, will, the stump, will tell you a story about the surrounding environment. And the, the tree never lies. So it will capture the environmental conditions. It will capture if humans have introduced toxins. It will capture good years and bad years. The archive that we collected is kind of a social, it's an example of social dendrochronology. And all of those daisy chains of killings are in the tree ring, but in an interesting way. So we see stories that come in after the killing of Ahmed Aubrey, after the killing of Tamir Rice, after the killing of Freddie Gray, after the killing of Philando Castile. I could go on and on and on and on. But you don't necessarily see those names in the archive. So if you go to the archive, if you go to the website, and you put George Floyd's name in, you might be surprised at the small number of stories that will come up. Because when that happens, people don't write about George Floyd. They write about their son. Dimitri writes about Ahmed Aubrey, but he's talking about, I run. And I run in neighborhoods where I, there aren't a lot of black people. Could this happen to me? And so it's interesting that it's an archive that captures these things, but the intimacy of the stories that people share don't, they, re, they, they refract off the headlines instead of reflecting the headlines. And would, would you mind here telling the story of your family portrait? So in the chapter where I include a lot of these stories, there's a, um, there's a story of a woman, for instance, who's, her six words are, I wish he was a girl. And she sent those six words in after she, the night that they released the grainy footage of the killing of Tamir Rice, where the police roll up on him in that gazebo, and they think he has a gun, and you see a 13-year-old you know, body fall. Her son was that age, and she sent in those, those six words. Um, I was in the newsroom talking, actually I wasn't in the newsroom, I was on the phone, talking to my editor, Michael Duffy, and for some reason I mentioned that I always keep a picture at the front door. He's like, why do you do that? And I said, well, because I need to make sure that if something ever happened, that people would know that we live in the house that we occupy. And he's like, what? And I explained to him, no, I, you know, because we live in an integrated neighborhood, and if you know, people come into my house and it's a Saturday and you know, I don't look like this. I know Beyonce says I woke up like this. I don't wake up like this. 
And, you know, and if it's at, at the weekend, if it's like, if they encounter the Saturday version of my husband, you know, would they, how would they respond? And so I keep a picture at the front door of our family and we're on vacation and we're smiling and happy and, uh, and it's kind of an insurance policy. And we had to cash that in one night. We were out of town. My son Norris was home. He is a tennis fanatic. He was up in the middle of the night watching the Australian Open because he believes that tennis must be watched live to get the, the, the real, so you understand, you're one of those people. And he was making a like 3 a.m. fridge run and he tripped the alarm. And we were out of town. And the police come, and at that point, our doorbell didn't work. And so they rocked around to the back of the house, and Norris sees the police, and he's in the kitchen, and so they signal for him to go to the front door. And he is, hair is all over the place because he'd just taken his braids out. He's got, you know, and it's his house. He should be able to do whatever he wants. But he's wearing a college T-shirt, Raven slippers, and the police, he lets them inside, and they're asking him questions. Um, do you live here? Yes. Where are your parents? They're out of town. How long have you lived here? And he's, we had just recently moved, so he's doing the math. Is it a year? Is it 18 months? And then he remembers the picture. That's us. And he points to the picture. And the police look at the picture, and everything changes after that. Because, okay, they're assured that he's in the place where he belongs. Now, I don't know if that would have happened if my son had blonde curly hair. I don't know, I don't know. You're sh you think you know, yeah. I think we actually do have a good idea. And that's why that picture will stay at the front door. And it changes when, so I have, a, I have different pictures because when he has braids, then the picture has braids. When he doesn't have braids, when he's got the big fro, the picture, so it always looks like him. Um, my oldest son just had a baby, had to change the pictures and the rotation of pictures to make sure the baby's in there. Um, and when Carter grows up, well, I still have to do that when my grandson is 18 years old and visiting me. I hope that we live in an America where I no longer have to do that, but that's about assumptions. And as you're sitting in the audience thinking about this, do you think you'd have to do that in your house? Should anybody have to do that in their house? I want to bring us back around to the big rising issue that we're all heading into, which is Trump, and how you think, what you heard about why people support him, and what you think is going to happen now. So another one of the surprises, um, we, you will encounter a lot of people who are very conservative in the book, who say things like, white privilege, white privilege earned it, enjoy it. Um, and that was another surprise to me also. And in some cases, people would come to the inbox, uh, well, I bet you're never going to post this. And then we'd post it. Oh. Oh. I get my say too. And we have been criticized a little bit because of that, because some people say, why, why, does, why, does, why do they get a seat at the table? But we're trying to hold a mirror up so that America sees itself. And if you're going to actually understand race in America, you need to see. You know, you need to see all of it. And so if it's not threatening, if it's not an ad hominem attack, if it's not um, you know, so hateful that, that it puts someone in danger, we, we include it. People are experiencing vertigo. And for lots of reasons. I mean, some of it is, has to do with demographics. Some of it has to just do with uh, America's changing. You know, America's, it feels like a lot of people get up in the morning with their fists balled up. We have, we, we are in a moment where we understand that when people talk about progress, people talk about the coming majority, minority culture as if it is a moment of progress. So when you see 
headlines about that, you know, 2047, 2046, whatever year it's going to happen, it feels like progress. It does not feel like progress to everybody. For some people, it feels like a very scary thing. And if, as I've listened to people, I, I, I don't condone the fear of that, but I understand it. If, if you have spent any time looking at how minorities in America have been treated over centuries, you would reasonably be concerned about becoming one. I mean, that's real talk, right? And if people don't figure out how to talk about these things and people don't figure out how to demonstrate the kind of leadership where we have a message that, you know, there's room for everybody, it's going to be okay, it's easy for people who are invested in a divided America to manipulate people's feels or to exploit people's fears or to create a, a, a chasm that benefits them. There, there is a, there is a, industry right now in America that is invested in our division. They focus group it, they figure out the right messaging, they figure out the right way to deliver that message. They are invested in divisions, usually because it benefits them. And what I ask people to consider is how much does it benefit you? Now it may make you feel good to know that you are better than someone but is that tank of gas less expensive? Is your rent less expensive? Is your life better? And, and I know this because we do work in universities, we do work corporations, we do work in sports teams, we do work in factories where the foreman of the factory is dealing with real issues because the divisions in America are suddenly affecting their productivity. They have a higher rate of injury. They have a higher rate of people who are calling in sick. People aren't talking to each other. The divisions have real consequences. They affect our GDP. They affect our military readiness. And that's why I feel we have to figure out how, it's not just about talk, like getting people together to talk about these things, but understanding that there are people who are deeply invested in divisions, and do we have enough people who are invested in uniting America and who are using their platforms and their voices to figure out how to unite America? Because I can tell you, I have been in some of the reddest counties, in, in factories in these places where you walk through the parking lot, and the parking lot tells you a story of just how divided that factory floor is going to be. Right, because you've got Black Lives Matter over here and you've got MAGO over here and you've got, you know, and, and inside that factory, even regardless of someone's political proclivities, whatever their, their political leanings, their perspective, they realize that inside they've got to figure out how to get people to row together and work together. And in the conclusion of the book, I, I have decided that I no longer use the phrase common ground freely because I think it's asking too much to ask people to occupy the same ideological space. But what we need are bridge builders. And what we need are people who are good at this. And we need to recognize that that is a skill. It's not taught in business school. It's not elevated or celebrated. I wish that we had an award that was almost on par with a Nobel Peace Prize you know, for people who figure out how to take divided communities and get them to work together. I'll give you a good example of that. This is a sports town, right? <laughs> and this is also a city of fiefdoms, right? I mean, Boston doesn't always get along very well. But you all fly the flag on Sunday when people are playing football, right? You all fly the flag at Fenway when they're, when they're playing baseball. The sports teams themselves are examples of this because the owners, they're in one place politically often. The coaches sometimes are in one place politically often. The players come from someplace else, and yet they figure out how to go and sit in somebody's living room and talk to their mama and get them to sign on to the sports team in college and then in the pros, and they figure out how to do it. And we need to have more spaces 
where people figure out how to do it and to recognize that it's going to be really hard and there's going to be a lot of indigestion and it's not going to feel good to everybody and to just make rules that we're going to stay at the table even if it becomes difficult because the dividend of us figuring out how to work together is greater than the discomfort of the divisions that we're all forced to live with right now. That does. It feels like a good place to close. Unfortunately, we could talk for a very long time. I cannot emphasize enough how much you should read or listen to this book yourself. It's almost like a personal journey where you just uncover things in yourself by listening to other people and listening to you. So thank you so much for giving us a taste of that tonight. It's been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great to be with you. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. You don't need me. Go out in the lobby and buy her book. It's a fantastic, beautiful book. Thank you so much to Michelle and Rupa. Another round of applause for these two.